This is a lecture for my administrative law class. We're going to be talking about the Commodity Futures Trading uh, Commission case versus Shore. So let's take a look at our slides. And this is part of our series on public rights doctrine, public rights, and private rights, or, or our unit on that in the book. Now, remember, the area of law where this comes up the most often is with bankruptcy courts because they are not Article III courts and they are often um, making little decisions, it appears, on contract claims and various other types of claims. So we're talking about CFTC v. Shore. This is a 1986 case that's in our administrative law casebook. So the relevant statute in this case authorized the commission, the CFTC, to adjudicate claims and counterclaims arising under its coverage. The parties were also free to pursue counterclaims in the normal Article III forum. So, and in some ways this sounds like a very boring case, but it raises some interesting constitutional questions uh, related to administrative law. So sure um, is the main party in this case, and Shore is a disappointed investor. He's been using a stockbroker um, and basically buying uh, futures and commodities and didn't get a very good return, lost all his money, his investment. And so he's blaming his broker uh, for this. And so he filed, sure, the disappointed investor files complaints with the um, commission that oversees commodity and future uh, bro and futures brokers um, against Conti. And Conti is our um, uh, commodities and futures broker and, um, and others alleging regulatory violations and seeking reparations before the commission from Conti. In other words, give me my money back. Um, I lost everything and I was supposed to make money, not lose it. Um, but the broker said, as a matter of fact, not only um, is this all your fault, but you owe us fees, right? Brokerage fees um, in your, you actually have a negative balance in your account. So you're not at zero, you actually owe us money. So Conti, the broker files an action against Shore at the same time in uh, federal court for Shore's debt owed to the brokerage because he had a negative account balance. So Shore counterclaimed in that court action. I know this is already getting confusing. Um, and, and which is basically, remember, this is a traditional just contract claim by a brokerage saying, hey, you owe us unpaid fees. You have a negative account balance. You need to pay up. And he basically said, I'm entitled to reparations under the act um, in this forum. And then filed a motion to dismiss saying, look, um, I've already filed this same complaint as this counterclaim before the commission itself. So the court shouldn't decide anything right now because the, com the uh, complaint is pending before the commission. We should wait and see what the commission decides since this is really un under their purview um, before the court wades into this case. And if I win, then that kind of settles everything. And so he said, let's do this and Conti should have to file a counterclaim with the commission instead. So what happens, is, I know this is a little confusing because we have two cases, two parties and one of these parties, sure, files with the commission, Conti files in, federal, in traditional article three court. And so then sure, in, who's being sued in the article three court, says, files a counterclaim saying, I want everything decided with the commission. And Conti then has to file a counterclaim with the commission. So one is the defense, we have the same two parties in both cases, except in one, one is the plaintiff and the other is the defendant filing a counterclaim. So Conti did what the court said and withdrew his lawsuit and filed its counterclaim for Shore's negative account balance before the commission as Shore had demanded. And then Shore lost at the commission. The administrative law judge ruled in Conti's favor on both claims and said, Shore, first of all, this wasn't your fault that you lost all your money. You're just bad at this. And secondly, you need to pay up and pay your broker's fees. And so Shore's initial reparations claim and Conti's administrative counterclaim, he loses. So Shore's unhappy with this result. So then he brings a challenge to the constitutionality of the whole statute and says the CFTC shouldn't either shouldn't even exist or shouldn't be deciding 
Conti's claim against me. So it's fine if my complaints against the broker don't go anywhere, the commission dismisses those, but the commission shouldn't be able to owe me to pay up on my brokerage fees because that's a contract claim and should be in a regular common law or article three court. And his argument convinced the district and circuit courts, but the Supreme Court reversed and sides with Conti again. And so here's our questions. Now that's all you need to know about that case. And it really doesn't get any more interesting than that, sorry. Um, so the real issue here is when can agencies adjudicate related claims that could have been decided by a traditional um, court, like a judge and jury? And here are factors that are, you can really discern from this case. And by the way, there was kind of a spate of cases that came close together in the 1980s in this area. And, um, and then every once in a while, we have a few more of these cases come up that harken back to CFTC v. Shore and so forth. And the ones, and again, uh, often in bankruptcy related cases. So first, you, we start with a specialized area of law. So the agency adjudication is fine if it's limited to a narrow field of cases that relate closely to its regulatory purview, as in Shore, instead of cutting across the whole gambit of common law claims, right? So we're not, we're not creating an agency and saying, you get to do property law now, um, or you get to do contract claims. Instead, we're creating an agency and saying, we want you to supervise the brokers who are um, getting investors um, to invest in commodities and futures. And the, um, so, and then if it's okay, we're going to allow this if it still preserves other aspects of judicial power like habeas corpus or jury trials because it, we don't want agencies doing these things. And then you, we like it if you still have the option of choosing an Article Three court for the private right involved. And that was true in this case. Remember, Shore started um, with a complaint, but Conti started his, uh, it, it's a, a complaint for unpaid brokerage fees in a regular Article Three court, like it was supposed to. This was a garden variety, like, first year contracts claim, right? You, you signed a contract that you would pay a certain amount of fees either per month or on transactions and so, so and or percentage or something like that. And you didn't pay and you need to owe us, you owe us under your contract. And so the parties um, for the things that are not related to the agency's regulation itself that are true common law claims like a contract claim could still be tried in their usual forum. Also, it's very important, this is an absolute rule that we have judicial review on questions of law that are private rights, not just regulatory actions, but um, private disputes between private parties, the reviewing court will have de novo review. And so to apply this to um, this case, I want you to think about the fact that we're gonna regulate um, commodities brokers and futures brokers and, um, and, and currency brokers and people like that that are dealing with a specialized type of investment vehicle that's high risk. It can be high return, but it's high risk and it requires, it's really for sophisticated investors, not just a first time person who's buying stocks or something like that and has never done it before. And so we regulate, we license these people. Um, we regulate, we have rules, we have disclosure rules, things that they have to inform their customers about. That's all regulation. And of course, the, the same entity that might be licensing um, the, uh, the brokers for commodities and futures trading are going to um, monitor them and keep an eye on them or uh, uh, watch over what they're doing and whether they're misleading or um, uh, luring investors into uh, things who aren't aware of the risk and so forth. So that's, that's okay. If, if you're going to, if you're the entity that gives licenses, then it's okay that you are monitoring, monitoring the activities of, and the compliance of um, your license, the people that you have licensed as the entity. So that's the regulatory claim, just to make sure you understand. And then a claim over something like unpaid fees is just first year contracts, really. So let's go back to our slides and see a little bit more about what's going happens with this case. 
Also remember that it's important to the court in this area that enforcement by a regular court is still necessary. So let's say Shore says, I don't care what you say that, that I owe Conti money, I'm not paying. Well, at that point, the Conti um, or the CFTC is going to have to turn the case over to the Department of Justice or a US Attorney's Office, and they're going to file a motion in a regular Article III court um, to force, uh, to execute on his account, right? And um, so we have another layer for protection besides the judicial review of the case and the appeal and the merits of the case from a law standpoint, but enforcing this, in other words, executing on people's bank accounts is going to um, loop back through the regular court system. The agency can't just show up at the bank and say, empty this guy's bank, write us a cashier's check and empty their, um, his account. Okay, so the court here admits the county, county's counterclaim before an agency involved a private right that would normally be the domain, domain of Article Three courts. And that was the third factor I had above. And even so, the court says this is outweighed by the other factors here. And please note that Conti's claims for unpaid fees is a traditional private right, a regular contract claim, but the statute limits the commission's adjudication of private right claims to a narrow class of actions related to its primary regulatory purview. In other words, you can't just file, a, a brokerage can't file a claim like out of the blue against an investor for unpaid brokerage fees with the CFTC. Instead, this has to be related to um, the actual uh, regulatory complaint that's already under consideration with that broker or some sort of licensing issue uh, with that broker. And if it's related to, and then we have something that's closely related to the, the fees from these same transactions, that's okay. On the other hand, if Conti had a contract, let's say, um, to do marketing consulting for his broker. So he uses their brokerage services and then they turn around and hired him to, I don't know, um, collect their trash, mow their lawns, do their advertising and marketing or something like that. And the dispute was about that. Then the CFTC couldn't decide that dispute. That's an unrelated contract claim between the same parties. Now, in 2017, we had a U.S. Supreme Court case that actually referenced Conti and, and said what they think it stands for now. And so, the, and they actually numbered it with five points. I'm sorry, Conti, uh, the Shore case, the CFTC v. Shore is still being cited. And it's the interpretation or application of it has evolved a little bit. So just, we're almost done here, but here are the five um, things that CFTC v. Shore has come to stand for. First, the claim and the counterclaim concerned a single dispute. It's the same account balance that we're talking about here. The agency's assertion of authority involved only a narrow class of common law claims in a particularly particularized area of law. In other words, the agency, um, the CFTC wasn't trying to settle personal injury claims and every sort of uh, common law claim. It was only basically brokerage fees uh, um, that are related to complaints against a broker. So a very specific specialized area of law. Third, the area of law in question is governed by a specific and limited federal regulatory scheme as to which the agency had obvious expertise. And so, as you might imagine, the people that work at the commissioners at the CFTC know a lot about um, commodities and futures trading and things like that. And so, in this type of investment, who invests, how the market works, um, and what the risk is, and so forth, um, year to year, they have a lot of experience in this area. They know the, who, how the brokers work and how the fees work and so on. And we have a regulatory scheme. So this isn't a situation where Congress just created the XYZ agency and said, here, you get to do torts and we're taking that away from the judicial branch or something like that. This is a specific, it's basically a licensing regime for commodities uh, or for in futures brokers. Fourth, the parties had freely elected to resolve their differences before the agency. So there were choices. And remember, one of the things that kind of ticked off the Supreme Court was Shore is saying the agency should never have gotten to decide this claim, but it was only be 
before the agency at Shores insisted. So he insisted that the claim um, be decided by the agency. And then when he lost, he said the agency shouldn't have been allowed to decide that. Well, that's poor, right? Um, of course, they're not going to like that. And then fifth, the CFTC orders were enforceable only by an order of a federal district court. So in order for, it to, for Conti eventually to get paid, um, if Shore refused, the, um, somebody was going to have to take the order from the CFTC and go to before a regular judge and ask to execute the judgment. And so um, these types of safeguards are in place. Now, I know that this is a lot of information and is a little bit technical, but we continue to have this issue come up. And a lot of times these are high stakes cases, uh, right? Cor big corporate bankruptcies and things like that. And so, and it's kind of a confusing area like where we draw the lines between these public rights and these private rights that are really arising out of the same transaction and we have the same tribunal rendering a decision and so this is how uh, this is justice roberts is now now basically says these are the five things that he sees in cftc be sure okay quick review question Public rights versus private rights issues come up in which type of case? A, when a court makes a decision what benefits one individual or special interest group, um, that benefits, I'm sorry, one individual or special interest group, but it's bad for the general public. Or B, when an agency adjudicator or bankruptcy judge is deciding a regulatory dispute and decides a related contract claim as well. Hopefully this is an easy question. You know the answer. If not, you should probably rewatch this video. And that concludes our lecture on CFTC, be sure.